As we uh, gather this morning, we do so with a common goal, to gather around and under the authoritative Word of God. It's the Bible, of course, who teaches us about God, who He is, and how He views our relationship with Him. Now, I grew up in a denominational setting, as a lot of you did, and uh, some of you did. And in that setting, there were certain things we got used to growing up in them. And if somebody spoke about a saint, we would picture something like this. <laughs> and notice in, in the depiction of a saint, the, the little round yellow circle around their head, that depicted a halo, if you're not familiar with that, that meant they were quite holy. And growing up as a child, this was very impressionable to me. Somebody that was a saint was extremely holy. They were different than everybody else. And uh, it, it was quite impressive. And I show this not to mock this, but to illustrate a point. I remember once I got saved, once I got born again, it surprised me to read and to hear in the Word of God and that everyday believers are referred to as saints. And I thought you had to be somebody like these, you know. And, and I thought only a few pe special people could earn that title. The Apostle Paul was especially fond of calling the followers of Jesus saints. In most of his letters, he refers to the recipients as saints, including the church at Corinth that had significant moral and theological problems. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. Even those true followers of Christ who were struggling in their faith and in their actions were referred to as saints. So what does a saint mean? In his most basic sense, a saint is a holy one, somebody who is set apart by God for his special purposes. And as a result, every follower of Jesus Christ is a saint versus a sinner, one that's set apart by God for his plan and his purpose. As a believer in Christ, God sees you as holy, a saint set apart for God because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And in your salvation, you were made holy, forgiven of your sins, washed clean, seated in heaven with God, above and not beneath, the head and not the tail. And the Bible says you're more than a conqueror. That's quite a list, but it's a biblical list. It's how God sees you and what he has accomplished in you, regardless of where you are in your walk with God. And so while this is true, and we gratefully walk in all of this, we also know that in our lives there's always more work to be done when it comes to our relationship with God. Not work, according to our salvation, that was accomplished in Jesus Christ and in the cross, but work according to our sanctification, moving our lives closer and moving towards maturity in Christ. Last week, and if you were here, I reminded you of something we looked at many years ago as we studied the Word of God. We saw that we are not only believers, we are supposed to be becomers. We're a believer in Christ, but we're supposed to become more like Christ. And as a believer in Christ, we should be continually work and be more Christ-like. Of course, once you're saved, you start a process to become all that God has for you, this sanctification process. Paul recognized this in his life, and while Paul had achieved great things and had grown tremendously in Christ, and he recognized that no matter where he was, he still had more to go as well. He was not satisfied where he was at, and we would all love to obtain what Paul had obtained in our relationship, but he didn't satisfy him, and we shouldn't be either. In Philippians chapter 3, he writes of the wonder of knowing God and how he hungers for more of it and, and kind of sets up where you can go with God. And then he states this in 3.12 and following. Not that I've already obtained all this or I've already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, that would really help you when you're struggling with your past. You've got to look forward. Forgetting what's behind, straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And our quest to become a becomer 
to become more like Christ. We, we began last work, last week rather, looking at where God in our life, where he's accomplished this. And we saw that God, through the Holy Spirit, has a definite, definitive, definite goal and plan to accomplish his divine development, I would call it, in our lives. And he defined it in a chapter and verse we're familiar with, Galatians 5. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And we noticed last week and have pointed out that God chose us to use the word fruit, not the work. It's not the work of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is God's work. It's the Holy Spirit indeed working in your life to accomplish God's character in you. But the result of the work is his fruit in your life. If you remember, we said this fruit is referred to in the original language as mature fruit, ready to be harvested. I mean, it's complete, it's mature, it's done. We're, not, we're like Paul, we're not there yet, but the Holy Spirit is always working in your life to accomplish all these character traits of God. So as we begin this new year, if you will, we should approach it with the goal, of course, of growing in Christ. And to close this year, God willing, more mature in Christ than we begin. Because after all, that's God's goal for you. He is determined and revealed his process in doing so. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to develop his fruit in us, causing us to grow in the character traits of God, to become more like him. As I sought God and began praying a while back about where to begin this year with you and us, and I kept coming back to this. I looked at my notes, and it's been just short of 10 years since we actually did a series and preached on the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I know I could use a refresher. I'm not sure about you. <laughs> it's important to understand, interesting to understand, the importance of the fruit of the Bible. The Bible begins and ends with fruit. In Genesis chapter 2, man is placed in the garden, as we know, and specific instructions to tend and keep the garden, to watch over it, to be knowledgeable of it, and to keep it in order and productive, bearing fruit, and producing much. Much like we're to do with the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Through disobedience, man fell by partaking the one fruit God said and commanded him not to. And at the very close of Scripture, the very last chapter, we see fruit once again in Revelation. Understanding the Bible talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of God and don't eat the fruit, all of that. And then we see this in Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the land. In the middle of a street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The Bible begins with fruit, ends with fruit, and we see fruit throughout the Word of God as well. We have said that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is just that. We said it's His fruit. It's kind of a way of review. It's not our fruit. It's His fruit. It is God's fruit, divine fruit, in your life. Jesus helped us clarify this for us. It's very interesting. We see it in John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in a vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. You cut a branch off a tree, it will never bear fruit again. Ever, and that's the idea. He goes, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them in a fire and they're burned. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. For my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so you will be my disciples. 
If you've ever had any kind of flowering trees, you know they need trimming to stay healthy. Years ago, we had a flowering tree and had some bugs land on it, and we didn't really realize that the next year it wasn't doing very well. There were some leaves that weren't producing much at all. I don't know much about that kind of stuff, but I took it to an expert. They told me what had happened, and we had to cut off the branches that weren't producing, and we had to kind of trim back the ones that were still healthy somewhat and then feed it to help it along because it wasn't producing much. And doing so help the parts that were producing a little bit so that they would not eventually die. Because that's what happens when you don't take care of it. It eventually comes in death. And that's what happens in our life when we don't tend to the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Consider verse 1 of what we just read. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And we know he does all this through the Holy Spirit. So look at the wholeness, the fullness, the Trinity involved in your life. Christ says, I am the vine, you get your life from me. But the Father dresses the vine, it isn't through the work of the Holy Spirit, pruning your life that you may produce more fruit for God. I prune those trees because they were valuable to us, important. And it's because God loves you. He wants the very best for you that he's the vine dresser in your life. We hear, oh, God's going to do some pruning. Oh, that's going to hurt. What's he going to take out of my life? That's not how he looks at it. That's how we look at it. What, 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 what's going on? No, he wants to take the stuff out of your life that's draining you, killing you, that you may bear more fruit. If we look at it that way, it's like, prune me, Lord. A few verses later, Jesus said that he chose you and appointed you so not only that you would bear fruit, but that you would bear much fruit. And have you ever fully considered the importance of bearing fruit in your life for God? We go through life worried about what's about us and what's happening in life. And Lord, what have you done for me lately? And that's all part of being a Christian, I guess. But do we ever really consider the importance of bearing fruit for God? Matthew and Mark account the time that Jesus came upon a fig tree that Though it looked good on the outside, it did not have any fruit. If you know the story, Jesus pronounced judgment against it and withered up and died from the throat. And then Luke, we see Jesus telling a parable of a man that had a vineyard, and for three years he'd go to this one particular tree along the vineyard, and it didn't produce any fruit. So the owner tells the vine dresser, cut it down, get rid of it. It's not producing any fruit. And the gardener requests, he's give me one more year. I'll give it special attention. I'll fertilize it, and if it doesn't produce, and then we'll cut it down. Now, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, but the, the illustration of the parable there is to illustrate the mercy and grace of God. Give me another year. Let me work on this. But at the same time, where there's mercy and grace that God is very exhibited here, there's a point in which God expects fruit. There's a point of God saying, we expect something out of this. That's what it's created for. If you're a Christian made in the likeness and image of God, saved by Christ, there's, there's a purpose to your life, and it's to glorify God and bear fruit. We begin to see that God desires godly fruit in our lives. He desires it, but he also enables us to have it and have it happen to us. And the reality is, in your life, you will bear fruit. Period. Well, what kind will you bear? Scripture talks about a fruit that produces a harvest of death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 7.4 informs us that in our salvation we're dead to the law, but now to Christ, so that we bear, may fight, bear fruit to God. And then we see this in the following verse, 7.5. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. When you didn't know Christ and you're in the flesh, the things you sought after in your life would eventually bring death. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end of is death. And as believers, becomers, we want to bear divine fruit through the Holy Spirit. Last week we began to look at the first on the list, Love, and we said love is first simply because all the other fruit wouldn't exist without love. 
as God willing, we work through this list, we'll see that all the things that were called to grow in the fruit of the Holy Spirit are there because love helps it. Love feeds it, and without love, you wouldn't have it. Even our ability to love is from God. And true love is supernatural. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because he first loved us. And some translations say we love him because he first loved us. And I guess you can look at it both ways, but no man can love without God placing love within him. And all of mankind has the ability to love because God first loved all of mankind. But he wants to take you and me so much deeper than that. Scripture tells us and informs us that God is love. And when you love, the manifestation of God is coming through you because love is a divine manifestation of God. Because we love because he first loved. We don't look at it that way. If you pay any attention to music or TV or the movies, they don't look at love as a divine manifestation of God, that's for sure. We get that. True love, biblical love, comes from God. That's why it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not your fruit. You're just blessed to function in it and hopefully grow in it. And the natural man, without God, without Christ, does not love with God's divine love. It's impossible without the Spirit of God resting within him. The natural man is selfish with selfish desires. I'm not saying that a non-believer can't love. I think they can love deeply, but they can't love with agape love, and they don't have the Holy Spirit with inside of them to go to the depth of love and the understanding of love that God has for us. And God commands us to love. Jesus said in John 15, this is my command, love each other. He commands us to love and enables us to love. And he also defined what it means to love. We see this in Mark 12, following, 29 following. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second one, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. He's quoting Jesus as Deuteronomy 6. And we want to love God, and we work towards loving and everything. What about loving our neighbor? That's sometimes not as easy. I shouldn't even say sometimes. But Christ said to love the Lord your God with all your heart. God gives himself totally to you in love and looks for the same from you. And here you consider your heart to be your emotions as well as your thoughts and will. Everything you think and feel and love is a love God with everything you've got, with your whole heart. I mean, we say that, oh, I love you with all my heart. You know, this Valentine's Day is coming up. and <laughs> That's not the love that God's talking about. To love God with every fiber of your being. Love the Lord God with all your soul. In this instance here, the soul is your inner man. The Greek word is suke, which we get psyche from. And the root word means your spirit. Love God with all your heart. Love God from your inner man, your spirit man. To love God. Love God with all your mind. Love God with every thought that you have. Love God with all of your understanding. Grow in understanding. Love God with your intellect. And that's important to understand because sometimes as outsiders will accuse Christians as taking a blind leap of faith. Christianity is not a blind leap of faith. It's a knowing, studying, understand who God is. Love God with all your mind. To know who he is, to think about him. And love God with all your strength. And you could say love God with all your body. I mean, it's certainly a biblical truth. What we do in our bodies should glorify God. We can give him all we have, give him all our strength, love God with everything we have, every strength that is in us. And notice that he said this is the first commandment. It's the ultimate commandment. The truth is you will not love others with divine love until you first love God. Jesus, to find what is love, Furthers the definition. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
That's not always an easy commandment to fill, but yet loving God is loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor is loving God. So we might ask just how do we show God's love to our neighbor? We find that out in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. But before we see the love chapter, before he writes what love is, if you will, he qualifies love. Beginning of chapter 13, <clears throat> though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but not have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am not. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. We can speak fluently every language known to man and to angels. Without love, all it is is a bunch of unpleasant noise. We could move mightily in spiritual gifting. We desire that. It possess all understanding and all knowledge and have a most remarkable faith. Without love, we don't amount to anything. It means nothing. We could give away every single thing we owed, even be burned at the stake for our faith. Without love, it doesn't mean anything. It has zero value. Love, our possession of it, is the ultimate value. Without love, you have nothing to say. You are unpleasant, you don't amount to anything, and your actions and deeds are worthless. That's Scripture. Look at the value God places on love. Without love, you say nothing, have nothing, and are nothing. I wonder if we place the same value in love, divine love, that God does. So after qualifying love, he defines it. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love suffers long and is kind, patient, long-suffering. You know, we struggle with patience. We, get, we don't often feel we have enough time for patience. And if we're honest about it, people bug us. We just need to acknowledge that, right? There are some people, probably more than it should be, that just bug us. That's not love. We know to be patient because love is patient. We may work at being patient. Struggle and resist the urge to be hasty or judgmental. <laughs> we preached last week on some of this stuff when we talked about a critical spirit. And I am surprised I asked the Holy Spirit to show me how many times I'll say a little subtle thing that's criticizing? I had nothing to say this week. I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. But that's the reality of it. You don't know how many times you think, uh, or I'll say something, I'll go, well, that was critical, unnecessary, non-edifying. And I'm not, well, I won't even go there. But never. It's hard to say I'm not a judgmental person, but I don't know about it. It's like, I think the Holy Spirit thinks different sometimes. What direction are we going in this? So we resist the urge to be hasty or judgment, and we work well and good, but you forget the remainder of the sentence. Love suffers long, love is patient, and is kind. True love, agape love, God's love that is shed abroad in our heart is enabling us not only to be patient, but kind towards the one we're being patient with. Really, Lord? I mean, i got to be patient with this person, and now you want me to be kind towards them? Well, yeah, because if you're not, you're not really patient. I want people to be loving and kind and patient with me. Don't you want people to be that way towards you? Love is tenderhearted. Love has empathy, sympathy, and compassion. Love is not mean. Love does not envy. Love does not look at what someone else has and covet it. In the original understanding, the original word brings clarity. When we covet, 
We go beyond desiring what someone else has. We go beyond desiring what we have, and we have feelings against the one that has what we desire. <clears throat> That's the understanding. We may desire things, and we may desire another person. But love does not envy. Love does not covet. Love blesses the other person for having what you don't have. And the following words are tied together. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. New Living Testament puts it this way. Love is not jealous, boastful, or proud. I mean, it's not hard to see where envy, jealousy, eventually turns into boasting and prideful behavior. Well, they got that, but you know what I got? You know what I did? And rather than being content in what God has provided for us in our lives, we desire what not is our, what's not ours. And then we puff ourselves up in our own eyes and in the eyes of others as well. And God simply says, love is not these things. Love does not behave rudely. <laughs> Can we skip that one? How many times have we blown it? How many times have we been rude with our family? We might be polite at work or let our frustrations out at home. Love is not rude. And certainly, God forbid, a store clerk or someone we're dealing with on the phone doesn't do what we want them to and pushes our buttons or frustrates us. Nobody here has ever been rude towards a clerk or somebody on the phone, have you? Come on. <laughs> when we're being rude, we think it's going to help our cause. We're not getting what we want, so we up the voice and harsher words, even though in love, you know, we're not going to swear, we're going to be, you know, that way. Come on, you're just being rude. And you think it helps your cause. And we're being rude to somebody. We're not treating the other person with kindness. We're not showing them respect. We do not see them made in the likeness or image of God. Would you speak that way to God? That person is made in the likeness or image of God. We've all been guilty. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But I mean, we don't need 1 Corinthians to tell us that's not acting in love. Love is not rude. Love does not show off, even spiritually. Not puffed up with an idea of self-importance. Romans 12 reminds us not to think more highly of themselves than we are. And it doesn't mean you walk around like as a worm and I'm no good and I'm a sinner. That's not what the Scripture says. We just saw the Scripture said you're seated in heavenly places. You're above and not below. You're more than a conqueror. All of that. But you don't walk around puffed up about who you are. You're grateful for what God's done in you. Love does not seek its own. It's not self-seeking. Some translations say love does not demand its own way. In other words, love is not selfish. And selfish defined is this here. Selfishness is placing concern with oneself or one's own interests above the well-being or interests of others. We can see that self-seeking selfishness is the opposite of love. Love is not provoked, thinks no evil. Some translations say this, love is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. And irritable is a good word here. <laughs> the Greek word means easily provoked and irritable means easily annoyed. <laughs> None of us ever get irritable. You know, just kind of cranky. And have you ever noticed that some people are more irritable than others, seriously? Are they easy to be around? No. We're not easily provoked. I mean, we can all be irritable. We can all be provoked. The wording here is not easily provoked. To check ourselves. Love is not easily provoked and thinks no evil. Truth is, when we're provoked, our thoughts can turn ungodly and evil. Anger or frustration for, towards somebody, rather than loving and kind. More than one translation said, love is not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> when we get angry, we quickly make a mental note of the offense. offense. That's keeping a record of wrongs. <laughs> if you're holding a grudge, then you're not functioning in love. 
You need to deal openly and honestly with someone when you're hurt. And many avoid confrontation. Some folks just don't like confrontation. So they avoid confrontation, but they do what we call banking the offense. They put it in the bank. They put it there. That's keeping a record of wrongs and not walking in love. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love is never glad when somebody else is hurt, regardless of what they are and who they are in their life. Love does not rejoice in someone else's pain. Romans 13 10 says, Love does no harm and so fulfills God's law. Love always rejoices in the truth. To love God is to love his word and to love the truth of his word as well as wanting his truth in your life. <laughs> the fruit for the Spirit is love, and love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. The New Living Testament says, Love never gives up. Never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. We all want to walk in love to a greater degree. And, and the reality is sometimes you can hear something like this and you go, oh, I'm not doing good there, I'm not doing good there, and you start feeling beat up with yourself. Listen, Scripture says it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So the key is following Him. None of us are doing where we should be. Paul said, man, I'm telling you where God wants to take you, what I've seen, how much I want. I haven't got there yet. I'm not there yet. We all say the same thing. So you don't get beat up with where you're at. You're saying, Holy Spirit, I want this in my life. I want to grow in this. I want more of this. So as we look into the fruits of the Holy Spirit, I think we see the value in it. Because after all, we want to go in Christ. This is what he wants for us. Why wouldn't he seek it even more? To allow ourselves to be pruned? Because as I listen to this message, I'm thinking, that needs to be pruned, that needs to be pruned. And what's going to be left? <laughs> oh, a healthy, a healthy flowering tree that will blossom in love for God. That's what he wants for you. I invite the worship team to come forward. John 15 here. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love there has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus' love is reciprocal. And he says, love sacrificially as he did and still does. And don't think it's optional, it's not. It's proof that you're a disciple of Christ. It's a proof that you're a believer becomer. By this, all men will you know that you're my disciples. How much verse you can quote. How much, how much you carry your Bible around, how much you act holy now, no. People will know you're his disciple when you love one another. Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. He talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Someone asked him, who is my neighbor? Love your neighbor as yourself, who's my neighbor? He talks about a man that was beaten and robbed, left for dead. The priest comes Upon him, and rather than help him, he walks on the other side of the road. Levi does the same thing. Then a Samaritan comes along, bandages him up, anoints him with wine and oil, places it on his own animal, takes him to an end, pays for everything at the end, and he says, if he needs more attention, give him everything what he wants, and I'll pay more when I come back. And then Jesus asked, which of these three who came along the man was his neighbor? The one that showed mercy. Love helps. Love extends mercy and compassion. And divine love seeks more of God. So in 2023, let your love be what others see. Let's stand together and worship our God this morning.